the, who I like to be when I grow up. <laughs> Please, Philippe Vadle, you're with you now. Well, I think when I grow up, I want to have something that's as widely used as Lua. <laughs> right, so, um, we're in this brave new world and it's a little bit hard to get feedback over these channels as opposed to being in a room where I can look at people's faces. Uh, if we were in a room, if I said something you didn't understand, you could interrupt me and ask a question or wave your hand about. So um, if I do say something that you don't understand and you want to ask a question, please do. That's a really important part of giving a live talk and either just unmute and go ahead and ask your question or use the raise hand feature and Roberto will um, bring you in to ask your question. But if there's something I say you don't understand, please do ask and I'll just test. I'll begin by saying, are there any questions now? Or does somebody want to just say hello so that we can feel cheery and interactive? Everybody is shy. No, thank you for the presentation that's coming. <laughs> Thanked in advance. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and um, it, it's fun to be able to do things virtually. I think the world's going to move much more towards this. And it's good we have this impetus to go in this direction because it uses up an awful lot of carbon for us to fly around. And we're going to have to move to doing this eventually. But I have to say, I am very sorry not to be in real Natal and to only be in virtual Natal. I look forward to going to Natal someday. I, I'm fortunate enough to get to spend some time in Rio de Janeiro uh, and indeed visiting Roberto. Um, but I'd like to see more of the country. I'm looking forward to visiting Natal someday. I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak here and all of you for being in the audience. So do your job and ask questions as I go on. So to start with, uh, everybody let me know, are you ready to learn about the hilarious subject of computability theory? So let's go, oops, uh-oh. Aha, uh -huh. the forward and back buttons have stopped working. It does that occasionally. Let's see if this works. Yeah, let's learn about the hilarious subject of computability theory. And you would probably think of a computer as something like this thing on the right. But back at the turn of the last century, a computer meant somebody like this, uh, a person that actually carried out a sequence of steps as a computation. So that's what computer meant, the person that did the computation. And in fact, I've chosen a picture of a woman deliberately because back then most of the computers were women. And as a result, when they started having programming computers and they actually had computers you could program, most of the computer programs, let's try that again. Most of the computer programmers were women until they realized computer programming is really very interesting. Let's get the men in there and, and kick the women out. And only now are we finally bringing the women back in where they belong. But anyhow, a computer was a person, the man or woman that carried out a sequence of steps. And of course, the name for that sequence of steps is an algorithm. So algorithms go back to Euclid's algorithm for doing division, uh, back with the classical Greeks, uh, before the Christian era, uh, around the year 800 of the Christian era, we've got al Khwarizmi, for whom algorithms are named. But it's not until the early 20th century that the notion of algorithm is actually formalized. And you get a paper by Alonzo Church introducing the lambda calculus in 1935. Uh, another paper by Gödel introducing recursive functions, which are a second uh, model of computation. So there are both models of what a computer can do, where, where by computer we now mean a, a modern machine, but back then they still meant a person. And then finally, um, Turing introduced Turing machines, um, all within a year of each other. So it's like buses. We wait 2,000 years 
for a theory of algorithms, and then three come along at once. Why did this happen? So let's go back to the turn of the last century. And David Hilbert was one of the leading mathematicians at the time. And he wanted what these days everybody wants, which is to put all mathematicians out of work. So his notion was to write down uh, formal logic. People were just beginning to be interested in formal logic. That only became possible when Boole began to write out logic as symbols. And so from the mid 1800s through the beginning of the 1900s, there's a lot of work on how do you go about turning logic into symbolic logic, something that could be written down as a series of symbols. And this was, Hilbert was one of the leading proponents of that. And with Ackerman, he wrote this textbook, The um, Foundations of Theoretical Logic. And in this book, he proposed what's called the Entscheidungsproblem, uh, which sounds much better in German. It just means decision problem. And the idea was that you would have an algorithm and you would give it a formula in symbolic logic and the algorithm would then compute whether that formula was true or false. So you wouldn't need mathematicians anymore. You could just replace them uh, by an algorithm. Now, at that time, one reason that they figured that the Entscheidungsproblem was decidable is because they figured that logic ought to be complete. So if you wrote out a statement, you would either be able to prove it was true or prove it was false. But um, there was a famous con conference in the 1920s. Hilbert gave a talk where he finished by saying uh, about mathematics, we will know, we must know. And the day after this young guy, Kurt Gödel, gave a talk where he said, well, actually, there's some things you can't know because logic is incomplete. There are things that um, you cannot prove are true or are false. And the way he did this is he had a very clever way of encoding. So logic would typically have some things it was about and most of logic at the time, what they were about were numbers. So you had numbers and plus and times and equal and things like that. And you could write down statements about numbers, but he wanted to write down statements about strings of symbols and symbol symbolic logic. So he came up with this clever technique called girdle encodings, where he turned a string of numbers, uh, sorry, a string of symbols into a single number. And so you could have a single number that represented a proposition. You could have a single number that represented a proof of a proposition. And then he wrote out a series of statements in logic. We would look at this today and say it was a, a functional program. Actually, some of the features he used here uh, ended up in an early version of Haskell. Um, and he finally gets down to saying, Right, okay, Here, here's a, a formula that says X, the number X stands for a proof of the formula which the number Y stands for. And then he could say there exists some number Y such that Y is a proof of X and that means X is provable. So you could actually write out um, as a statement and therefore as a number, the statement, this statement is not provable. And it did that by right, that state would actually have a number and it would refer to that number and then say, nope, that number has no proof. So you, he showed that you could write down the statement, this statement is not provable. Oi, once you can do that, you are in big trouble. So say the statement is false. So if it's false, then it is provable and Oh dear, since it's provable, you've proved something that's false. So that kind of undermines the whole point of proof. You should only be able to prove things that are true. This was back in Nazi Germany, but they still thought you should only be able to prove things that are true. Now, I, I understand that in the modern United States, 
in the modern UK where I live and in the modern Brazil, there are some people around who might disagree with this idea that it would be bad to be able to prove things that are false. Um, but back then they thought, no, that's really a bad idea. So the alternative, right, is that the statement is true, but then it must be not provable. And there you go, there's a true statement that's not provable. So you can have true things that you cannot prove. So that's what incompleteness is about. And as soon as Gödel came up with this, people began to go, oh, hmm, maybe the Entscheidungsproblem is not solvable, right? Since there are things that you can't tell if they're true or false, maybe there won't be an algorithm that can decide that whether something is true or false. So the race was on. Now, as long as you're looking for an algorithm, right, you don't really need a formal definition of algorithm. It could sort of be like Justice Stewart's definition of pornography. I know it when I see it, right? You write down the algorithm, you go, yeah, that's an algorithm. But if you want to show there is no algorithm, no way of doing this thing, then you might actually want a formal definition of an algorithm. So the race was on. So the first person to get into this was Alonzo Church. That's, I should change that photograph. That's rather an old photograph of Church. Uh, he was older than, he was in his thirties when he did this. Um, and he came up with what we now call the Lambda Calculus. And um, he showed that you could write down things like numbers and proofs and so on in Lambda Calculus. And then he showed indeed that there was an unsolvable problem of elementary number theory. That is something that a computer program could not decide. And in fact, what he showed was that the halting problem was undecidable so that you could um, have a, a computer program in Lambda Calculus turn that into a number, and then um, does the program with this number halt or not, you couldn't decide that. And in fact, the proof is very similar uh, to the one I just showed you about um, the, for incompleteness involves a negation again, because you can write out a program that says, this program does not halt. And you get a very similar kind of reasoning. So he showed there was a problem you couldn't solve, and therefore that the Entscheidungsproblem was not decidable, that you couldn't have an algorithm that would determine everything. And right, lambda calculus is this very small language. It's just got three constructs, variables, lambda abstractions, which stand for functions, and applications, which stands for applying a function to a number. So it's a very tiny programming language. It's become the basis of Haskell and of every other modern functional programming language. And um, right, I've been working with functional languages for years and by and large, uh, industry has managed to ignore what me and all my colleagues have done, except recently, uh, Lambda Calculus, has, uh, functional programming and Lambda Calculus has become much more popular. And so if you look at languages, now languages like C++ and Java and Python, they all have lambdas in them. So here's Duke, who is the um, mascot for Java, and he's looking very smug because about a decade ago, they finally got around to adding lambdas to um, Java. So, well, congratulations, Duke. You finally caught up with where Alonzo Church was back in the 1930s. Now, remember Kurt Gödel? So he actually came to Princeton where Church was, and um, he looked at Church's definition of what could be done on a computer, which was lambda calculus. And um, he had a word for that. He thought it was thorough. Well, actually he had two words. He thought it was thoroughly unsatisfactory. So Church said, well, come on, you come up with your own definition of what an algorithm is. And I'll show you that it's equivalent to my definition. So Gödel did this, he came up with what we now call recursive functions. He presented this as a series of lectures at Princeton and Church's student Kleene wrote this down with attribution to Gödel. Um, so this is just, um, again, if you look at this format, right? Phi of zero is something 
uh, phi of y plus one is something determined uh, in terms of phi of y. So this uh, zero and plus one notation, you could used to be do, able to do exactly that in Haskell. It's a very standard form of recursive definition. We use it a lot to these days. And so he did that definition. And then Cleaney and Church sat down and they showed, yes, any of these definitions could be encoded in lambda calculus. Anything that you could encode in lambda calculus, you could do here. So the two definitions were absolutely equivalent. And they went back to Gödel and they said, look, ours is the same as yours. And Gödel said, hmm, my definition is the same as your first Schlungener definition. Hmm, mine must be wrong then. So there was an impasse, right? Gödel really didn't believe in lambda calculus and the impasse was broken by Alan Turing, uh, who was, uh, had just completed his undergraduate education at Cambridge at the time. And he came up with what we now call Turing machines. Uh, he did this independent of the other work, but at exactly the same time. In fact, they just slightly beat him to publication. So Turing's supervisor was, was um, disappointed when he discovered that Church and Gödel had gotten there first, but they thought that there was something a bit different in Turing machines and they wrote to Church and Gödel and they said, yeah, that's kind of interesting. Uh, you should probably publish that as well. And indeed, Turing then went off and became a PhD student studying under Church. So they worked together. And Turing machines, the key thing that was different was that Turing did what, what we would, what was basically a bit of philosophy Turing gave an argument. He defined these uh, Turing machines. Uh, and then he gave an argument that anything a computer could do, a Turing machine could do. Where computer meant a human following an algorithm. So he showed that what Turing machines could do, what a machine could do is exactly the same as what a person following an algorithm could do. And right, a Turing machine is a bunch of squares. It has a state. And there's a little table that says in this state, if you're looking at this symbol, then this is the next state you go to. And then you either look at, stay looking at the same square or move the square to the left or right and maybe change the symbol. So just a big table. And he, point, he, he said that anything a person could do like this. He said, well, why look at one square at a time? Well, because a human being, could only look at a certain finite number of symbols at a time. For instance, consider, he actually wrote this, look at 9999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999
So I've, I've always thought that Turing had very good taste. So most people actually prefer Turing machines, but Turing himself preferred lambda calculus. So one thing that philosophers like to argue about is, is mathematics invented or discovered? And what I would say is that when you've got three really rather different formulations of what a computer can do, and then they all turn out to be exactly the same, right? It's not like a little small corner that one covers and the other doesn't. They are all exactly equivalent. That there was something, the reason that this happened is because there's something underlying there that's not just an invention of the mind, but is discovered. So, right, Gödel was 28 when he undermined the life work of Hilbert, who at that time was 68. Turing was 23 when he resolved the conflict between church, and there's a more appropriate picture of church, church at age 33, and um, Gödel, who by then was an ancient 30. So you young people in the audience, you know what to do. It's your job to keep explaining to your elders when we have got things wrong. And I really like this idea of mathematics, be, uh, of the idea of computation and lambda calculus being something that you discover rather than invent. Um, so I, I, I would love to be able to say that all of Haskell is discovered. There's no invention in there. And I, I can't say that. There are bits of it that um, clearly are invented. But um, the core of it, lambda calculus, is something that is discovered. If you look at other languages, uh, like... Uh, say something like um, Perl or JavaScript, I won't say Lua. Uh, you might look at those and you, 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 you know, very clearly, large chunks of those could not be discovered. They're just invented. And it, it's um, sort of sometimes amazing that even one person would invent that, let alone three people independently. Um, but for at least the core of Haskell, we can say that it is discovered. So, that's the history of computability theory. You've now learned about that hilarious subject. I'm gonna go on to talk about um, a second time where we can say something was discovered rather than invented. But before I do that, I'll pause for a moment. Are there any questions about the first part? Please. Nothing yet? Somebody say, nope, I have no question. No questions. No questions. <laughs> OK, well, well, we'll move on to the second part then. No questions so far. Crystal clear explanation. Thank you. OK, let's see if I can manage to confuse you with this bit. So let's go on and talk about propositions as types. So here's Gerhard Gensen. I, I mentioned all this was a lot of this was done in the 30s in Nazi Germany. I'm sad to tell you that Gensen was a Nazi, but um, he came up with the basis for logic as we use it today, um, something called natural deduction. And here are all the rules of natural deduction uh, as written out in his paper. And um, we're gonna focus on two rules the rules for um, conjunction. So this says if you can prove A and you can prove B, then you can prove A and B. And this says if you can prove A and B, then from that you can conclude A. So this is called an introduction rule because it shows you how you create a conjunction, something with and. This is called an elimination rule because it shows you how you can use something with and. What can I do if I've proved A and B? Well, I can prove A or I can prove B. And I've got the same rules written here. This is the modern way we write them. Here are the conjunction rules on the bottom. You can see the modern way we write them is exactly 
the way Genson wrote them out in 1935. Um, the only difference, right, this rule and this rule are exactly identical, except Genson wrote his A's and B's in German, and I'm going to write them in Roman, but that's the only difference. The other rule he had, also written in the same way, is um, another rule he had. He had a bunch, but we'll, we'll just look at these two. Um, so the other one is the one for implication, so it says, how do I introduce an implication? Well, let's assume A, just assume A is true. And if from that assumption A, I can prove B, then with no assumption, so we're gonna discharge this assumption, which is why we've written square brackets around it. I discharge the assumption, and it's this rule that discharges the assumption. So I'm gonna just put a label on this. I'm gonna call it the letter X and say, okay, this, dis this rule is discharged um, this assumption is discharged by this rule. And the justification for this rule is that it's implication introduction. So if assuming A, I can prove B, then assuming nothing, I know that A implies B. And if I can prove A implies B, and I can also prove A, then I can conclude B. And this rule goes back a long time. The ancient Greeks knew it. Um, it was known in the Middle Ages by the name modus ponens. May I ask a question? <clears throat> yes. Yes, sir. Does the original rules also have the label X? They do. Uh, so he doesn't show it here. Um, but in fact, when he actually writes out the proofs, he does put labels. However, uh, my labels are letters. His labels were numbers. So he would use one, two, three, four as the labels. I'm using X, Y, Z. But other than that, it's, he did it identically. Thanks. Um, and the key insight that he had was, right, logic was known, proof rules were known, but Genson's amazing insight was that they come in pairs. So you have an introduction rule paired with an elimination rule. You have an introduction rule paired with an elimination rule. You talk about how you create the connective and how you use the connective. You have a constructor and a deconstructor. So these things come in pairs. That was his key insight. And he made use of that to then talk about simplifying proofs. So uh, we'll talk about simplifying proofs in a minute, but let's just look at a particular proof to see how this works. So I'm gonna prove is that B and A implies A and B. What a silly thing to prove you say. That is completely obvious. Of course, B and A implies A and B. Well, yes, I agree with you. But since it's completely obvious, we really ought to be able to prove it, right? If we couldn't even prove something that was completely obvious, we would be in trouble. So can we prove this? using the formal rules I showed you? And the answer is yes. So what we'll do is, um, right, we want to show B and A implies A and B. So that means I'm gonna assume B and A and conclude A and B. I'm gonna use this assumption twice. And once I'm gonna use it with and elimination two, which says from B and A, I can conclude the second thing, A. And here by and elimination one, from B and A, I can conclude the first thing, B. And okay, I've got a proof of A and I've got a proof of B. So I've got a proof of A and B and now I can discharge my assumption. And so now I've got for that from B and A implies A and B with no assumptions whatsoever. Okay, so there's an example of a proof. Any questions about that? Okay, now he was really interested in simplifying proofs. And the reason he wanted to do that is if you could simplify a proof, you could um, get rid of any unnecessary connectives. And then you could show um, what was called the subformula property, which says that if you um, have a proof, you can simplify that to a proof that only contains formulas in your hypotheses, your assumptions, and formulas in your conclusion, and parts of those formulas, but no other formulas. 
So like that meant if you proved something whose um, assumptions and conclusion all involved ampersand and implies, and in the middle of the proof say you used or, you could simplify to a proof that didn't use or anymore. A more interesting example of this is if you were proofing something about geometry and in the middle you use some facts about algebra, you could simplify that proof to one that was purely geometric and didn't use algebra at all. So the subformula property was really quite interesting. And his first application of it was to show that you could not prove false. Because that's a proof that has no assumptions, one conclusion, false. So any proof you could do, you can simplify to one that just involved false and its parts. False doesn't have very many parts. So the only proof could be one that just involved false and nothing else. It's sort of like, what part of no don't you understand? Right? There are no parts to false. And, so, and then you could just trivially look and say, well, if you only have false, there's no way of, of doing a proof. And so he showed, indeed, you can't prove false, which is something you'd really like to be true. Uh, but he could show that, right? He could prove that there was no proof of false. So, he was interested in simplifying proofs. So what he did is he showed if you ever had an introduction rule followed by an elimination rule, you could get rid of that connective, right? So let's say I've got proof of A implies B. And how did I get that? Well, I assumed A and I proved B. I've got proof of A implies B. And somewhere else, I've got a proof of A. And of course, from that, I can conclude B. But we could prove B more directly, right? Because here I assumed A. Wait a minute, I don't need to assume A. I've got a proof of A right here. So we'll get rid of the assumption. We'll just replace this assumption of A by this proof of A, and then get a proof of B and there's B directly. So let's see what that looks like. Right, we're just replacing that assumption of A by the proof of A. Now we've got bigger proof, remember, we might use that assumption many times. So this might get a lot bigger. It can actually get exponentially bigger as you simplify it. But this is simpler in that it no longer has that particular formula A implies B in it, right? We got rid of one connective and you can keep doing that until you've gotten rid of all the connectives except those that are in your hypothesis or your conclusion. So here's another example. Let's say I've got and introduction. So that means I've got proof of A, I've got proof of B. And from that, I can conclude A and B. And then by the first and elimination rule from A and B, I could get A, right? If I know A and B is true, then I know A is true. But right, there's a much simpler proof of A. It's the one right here. So if we have ever have and introduction followed by and elimination, that just simplifies to a proof of A. Any questions about that? That's probably the trickiest thing I'm going to do. No. So, so you say that uh, you have introduction followed by elimination. Is this in, um, in, in the consecutive step or it could be, you know, in later on on the proof? It's only if you have an introduction immediately followed by an elimination. And then there's some other results that show that relevant introductions and eliminations will always come together. Okay, thanks. Good question. Okay, so these are the same rules I just showed you, but written out as um, on a sheet of paper rather than as animations. And then let's look at a slightly bigger proof and simplify it. So this is the proof we did before, that B and A implies A and B. And let's say I've got a proof of B, I've got a proof of A, so that means I've got a proof of B and A. Well, now by modus ponens, right, B and A implies A and B, and I've got B and A, so I can conclude A and B. So let's see what simplifying this proof would look like, because, um, aha, uh -huh, I've got an introduction followed by an elimination, so I should be able to simplify that, right? So I'll take um, this assumption of B and A and replace it by this proof of B and A. So I'll take this, I'll copy it to these two points. Let's see how this simplifies. Right, so that 
first proof now turns into this proof. And notice when I did this topping, now I've got an and I on top of an and E. In fact, I've got that in two different places. So I can simplify that, right? I can take this proof of A and just copy it down here, there, this proof of B and copy it down there. There we go. So now I've got a simplified proof of A and B. So I've simplified that proof. And in particular, right, um, if we go back, this proof has an imply symbol in it, which doesn't appear in the conclusion. And we've gotten rid of this imply symbol. So this is showing how you can get rid of symbols that don't appear in the hypothesis or conclusion. So we've gotten rid of this implies to symbol. Indeed, we've gotten rid of this um, assumption of B and A as well, right? So now we've only got A and B and its parts, right? A and B and the parts of those. So there's an example of how simplification works. Any questions about that? No. Okay, let's go on. So there's the whole proof written out on, on a single sheet instead of uh, as a um, animation. Okay, so that's logic um, as done by Genson. Let's go back to Church's Lambda Calculus. Church actually wanted Lambda Calculus as a, he first came up with it as a meta language for logic. Um, it was sort of like a, a language for writing out macros to simplify the logic. But it turns out, right, since you can write any program in Lambda Calculus, you could actually write things that would calculate infinite formulas. And it turns out if you can get infinite formulas, you get something called Curry's Paradox that lets you prove false. So it turns out if your formula could be any Lambda term whatsoever, you could um, get these infinite formulas and prove false, which is really bad for a logic, as we know. So um, he came up with a revised version of Lambda Calculus with a type system. And remember what Church did was he proved the halting problem was unsolvable. Well, this type system guarantees termination. Every typed program terminates in this simple type system. And that gave him a logic that was consistent. So it's very interesting type. So he came up with that in 1940. Um, so, sorry, 1932, he first came up with Lambda Calculus. 1940, he came up with what's called the simply typed Lambda Calculus. And so let's look at the type rules, simply typed Lambda Calculus. So um, remember from a term N, we can form Lambda X dot N. So what's N? It's gonna have some free variables X of type A. And then if N has type B, Lambda xn is a function, has an argument of type A and returns a result of type B. And what's an example of this? So A might be number, so X might be a number, N might be something involving X, it might be X times X, the squaring function. So if X is a free variable of type number, X times X is also a type number, and then Lambda X, X times X is the squaring function, whose type is give me a number and I will return a number. And then we could apply that. Let's say L is some function whose type is number to number and M is a number, then the function applied to its argument will itself be a number. So if L is a function from A to B and M is a term of type A, then L applied to M is a term of type B. We can also form pairs. So if M is a term of type A and N is a term of type B, I can do an MN pair, which is an AB pair. And then from L, I can extract its first component. I'll write that pi one for first projection. So if I've got an AB pair, its first component is an A. If I have an AB pair, its second component would of course have type B. So here's a program. Um, it takes a BA pair, 
and it returns an AB pair. So it's just going to swap the components. And here's Z is our BA pair. If we extract out its second component, that would be type A. If we extract out its first component, pi one of Z, that would be type B. We can then form a pair of these. So I've got an AB pair consisting of pi two of Z and pi one of Z. And then I can abstract over that free variable, turning it into a bound variable. So lambda Z, pi two of Z, pi one of Z is the swapping function. So it takes a BA pair, so Z is a BA pair, that extracts the second component, that's an A, and its first component, sorry, extracts its second component, right, that's an A, and its first component, that would be of type B, so that would be an AB pair. So it's a function that given a BA pair returns an AB pair. Any questions about that? Yeah, so uh, nowadays we have a clear idea of types as we see them in programming languages, like strings, integers, and so on. So what, yeah. of, what kind of types did these guys had in mind, like Church, when he proposed that? And I mean, what's, what was the main motivation? Probably separate something that's, uh, that uh, terminates from something that doesn't terminate. And, uh, but uh, yeah, so what right. kind of- Main motivation types? was to ensure termination. He actually yeah. only had um, function types. So he didn't even have pairs. He built pairs up from function types. He didn't have numbers. He built numbers up with what we now call church numerals. And then he had a single base type, which was called O. So um, a number would be, um, Actually, its type was O to O goes to O to O. Yeah, and I guess he was trying like to eliminate some expressions that someone could write in, say, untyped lambda calculus so that these would lead to non-termination, right? Right, so if you know what the fixed point combinator is, that cannot be typed in um, as a lambda term. Okay. And that's because the argument would have to simultaneously have type O and type O to O, and it's only allowed one type. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so there's an example of a program. It's the swapping program. And then you can evaluate a program, right? So given a term, we can simplify it. So, right, remember, here's our function, lambda z, which is a function from A to B. So that means as a free variable, um, Z of type A, from which we build up a term N of type B. And then we've got an argument to the function, M of type A. So how do we reduce lambda ZN applied to M? Well, we'll do a substitution, um, right? We'll replace Z, the formal argument, by the actual argument M. And so N, every place that Z appeared in N, we'll replace it by M. So let's do an example of that. Right. Again, what that means right, is that every occurrence of Z gets replaced by M and then N becomes N with every occurrence of Z replaced by M. And if you're familiar with lambda calculus, you know that this is just the way we reduce functions and it's called uh, the beta rule. So it just says substitute the actual for the formal. If we look at pairs, it's even easier, right? If we've built up an MN pair, where M has type A and N has type B, and then we extract out the first component, which is of type A, then we could simplify that, right? What is the first component of an MN pair? Well, it's just M. Right, so it's, that would simplify down to just M. And the thing to note here, let's go, right, is this term, of course, has type B, and when we're done, Right? It's still well typed because we replace Z of type A by M of type A, and then N still has type B. Right? So as we simplify it, right, we've got a well typed term of type B. We start with this term of type A and we simplify it and we get another term of type A. So what we've proved here is that as you simplify a program, 
it does not change its types. This is called type preservation. But notice we've also shown something else, which is the types are getting smaller, right? Here, we've got a type A implies B that's gone away when we're done. So the, type, the set of all types is getting smaller. Here, we've got an A and B, which when we're done has gone away. So the types are always getting smaller. All the types are finite. They can't get smaller forever. So eventually you must be done. So that was um, Church's, it was actually Turing that first wrote out the proof that simply typed lambda calculus, the programs always terminate. I think, yeah. Um, Turing in 1942 wrote out the proof that these things always terminate. So this is the proof. So first Turing and Church came up with the halting problem. And then they both showed that simply typed lambda calculus always terminates. So let's do an example of that, right? Let's take a, an actual program. So here's our swap program. Here's some pair, NM, where N has type B and M has type A. And then we take the swap program and apply that to the NM pair. How does this evaluate? Well, it says this Z here, we should replace it by NM. So let's go ahead and do that. Right, so all the Zs have now become NM. So where before we had pi two of Z, we now have pi two of NM. Pi one of Z becomes pi one of NM. And now we've got, oh, pi two of NM, I can simplify that. Pi one of NM, I can simplify that. So let's go ahead and do that. Aha. So what show us? That says if we've got the swapping function, and we apply it to an NM pair, right, we get this intermediate term, and then eventually it all simplifies down. Oh, it's gotten stuck. Oh, I broke the computer. Let's try that again. Uh, it eventually simplifies to the pair MN, which is of course an AB pair. So that shows you how swapping actually works and gives you an example of what substitution looks like. So here's the whole thing written out in full. So here's the swap function applied to a pair and eventually that simplifies down in this way. Okay, any questions about that? So I've very carefully, of course, written and for pairs and implies for functions, but we don't normally do that, right? We write arrow for functions and times for pairs because it's Cartesian product. Um, but what we've seen, right, is a close correspondence between this arrow and times and implies and um, conjunction. Um, so this is a drawing due to Luca Cardelli. This is called the Curry-Howard homeomorphism. But what we've just shown is actually an isomorphism, right? We've shown that implication in logic is the same as functions in lambda calculus, in simply typed lambda calculus, that conjunction in logic is the same as building pairs in simply typed lambda calculus. Why is that? Well, what is the proof of a conjunction? What's the proof of A and B? It's a proof of A paired with a proof of B. So it's like functions. What is a proof of A implies B? It's a function that given a proof of A returns a proof of B. So it makes sense to say that implication is just like functions. Conjunction is just like pairs. And so we have this very tight correspondence between these two things. And um, right, you will have noticed some similarities there. Now, I think the budget for SVLP was limited, um, but if it wasn't, I, I actually saw a magic show online the other day. And the way it worked was the magician sent a box to everybody who attended the magic show. 
it was called the present because they all got a, a box that they unwrapped and then it contained a pack of cards and various things and he got them to do the tricks. So um, I, I would have liked to have done the same thing. You have received a box in the mail with a pair of rose colored glasses and you would then put those on. If you put on your rose colored glasses and you look at, whoops. And if you put on your rose colored glasses and look at this, well, since they're rose colored, you won't see the red. You'll only see the blue and the black. And when you do that, it doesn't look like this anymore. It looks like this, right? So you can see that there's an exact correspondence between these things. We just wrote in some more stuff, but structurally they are exactly the same thing. They're not a little bit alike, they are identical. And indeed the structure is preserved. So propositions in the logic correspond to types in the simply typed lambda calculus. Proofs in the logic correspond to terms or programs in the simply typed lambda calculus. And simplification of proofs corresponds to evaluating a program. So all the structure is preserved and that's why we call it an isomorphism. It's a one-to-one -one correspondence that preserves all the relevant structure. And the proof, oops, let's, and then the proof that um, you can simplify a proof turns into the proof that normalization or evaluation of programs in simply typed lambda calculus always terminates. So Pascal Curry, um, a logician working at the same time as Church, uh, actually noticed a version of this, not for lambda calculus, but for something quite similar called combinatorial logic. Um, William Howard was the one who wrote this out for lambda calculus. And I, I, what I've showed you is actually a part of what William Howard wrote out in um, 1972, but wasn't published until 1980 in a fest shrift for Curry. So this is often called um, the Curry-Howard isomorphism. But in fact, the ideas go back further, this idea that um, a proof of an implication should be a function taking a proof of A into a proof of B and that a proof of a conjunction should be um, a pair of things, a proof of A paired with a proof of B. That goes back to the intuitionists in the um, 1920s, people like Brauer, um, Heiting, and Kolmogorov. So um, some people say, oh, you shouldn't call it Curry Howard, you should call it Brauer, Heiting, Kolmogorov. And that you get into large arguments about this. So I've stopped calling it Curry-Howard isomorphism uh, and start calling it propositions as types so that we don't need to argue about who gets precedence here. All these people had good ideas that were contributed. Uh, but here's the 1980 paper um, by Howard. And as you can see, it appeared in a fest trip to Curry and actually begins dedicated to Curry on the occasion of his 80th birthday. So this gives us, right, what I said it's the Curry-Howard correspondence, or pro which has propositions as types, which is the other name for it, but also proofs as programs and normalization of proofs is the addition of programs. So this is the point that all the relevant structure gets preserved. Now, when I first saw this, it was, um, I just moved to Oxford as a postdoc and they had a meeting in London where they brought across people, um, they brought across Per Mertenloth, who had building on Howard's ideas had come up with something called type theory as a foundational theory of logic and of computing, um, which again was very similar to something that had been done a little bit earlier by De, um, De Bruyne, who if you know about um, foundations, you know we, we sometimes, implement lambda calculus using something called the Bruin indices. 
So there'd been a lot of work on constructive logic by de Bruyne and Mettenloff and many others. And I went to a meeting about this and they explained this idea of Curry Howard. And I looked at it and I thought, ah, that's cute, but it, it's just a funny coincidence. And what became clear to me over the, and to many other people over the next few years was that it wasn't just a, a little coincidence. The first thing I saw was some work done by um, Griffin where he showed, uh, and then by Murphy, that showed that um, this embedding of classical logic and intuitionistic logic, which Gödel again had done in 1933, is exactly the same as this important technique in semantics and implementation called continuation passing style, which was written down by John Reynolds in 1972. And okay, so wait, it doesn't just, so the thing I've shown worked for something called intuitionistic logic, but it turns out that you, you get classical logic by adding the double negation law, the law that says that not not A implies A. Uh, and that's the same, it turns out, as continuation passing style. Um, so the original one was between natural deduction and type lambda calculus, uh, but then you've got classical logic and um, continuations. Um, type schemes correspond to the ML type system. And the result is, right, Genson and Church independently invented natural deduction type lambda calculus. There's this type system um, um, by the logician Hindley that turned out to exactly correspond to one independently invented by the, by the computer scientist Robin Milner, what we now call the Hindley-Milner type system that underlies ML and Haskell and most all typed functional languages. Jean-Yves Girard, a logician, came up with something called System F, which corresponded to Reynolds' polymorphic lambda calculus, which um, is basically generic types. So you, um, it's a generalization of what we have in the ML type system. Um, and again, right, these were independently invented once by a logician once by a computer scientist. So it turns out, and then it turns out, right, I've done a lot of work with monads. It turns out the type system of monads corresponds exactly to a particular modal logic, which Lewis came up with in 1910. So all these different systems um, independently discovered that turn out to be isomorphic. And the most recent example of that is Girard came up with linear logic in 1987. So this is logic where you um, keep track of resources. So normally, right, um, if you have an assumption A, you can use it any number of times. But if you say, nope, every assumption must be used exactly once. You can't ignore it. You can't use it multiple times. You must use it exactly once. That's linear logic. And then um, Kohei Honda looked at that and he came up with session types and he sort of took half of linear logic for session types. And the other half was just inputting and outputting stuff from a channel. Much later, um, Frank Fenning and Lewis Karras looked at this again and they said, well, no, actually the other two connectives of linear logic, which are a form of conjunction and a form of disjunction actually correspond to doing input and doing output. And so these two things, this was sort of not completely independent, but sort of a hack put on top of half of linear logic turned out to be isomorphic to all of linear logic. So again, there's some notion of discovery going on here. So what this is telling us is every good idea in programming ought to correspond to a good idea in logic. Now there's some really important ideas in programming like concurrency and state that we're still not exactly sure how they correspond here. I mean, you can do state with monads, so it sort of fits into this, but we would like more of a story about this. Um, concurrency sort of corresponds to communication with session types, so it corresponds to this, but we'd like more of a story about this. So there's more work to be done. What is the best story about how state in programming corresponds to a logic? What is the best story about how concurrency corresponds to logic? Maybe that will tell us the best way of doing concurrency, something that maybe is invented rather than discovered. 
but that's an open question. So um, that's where we've got to, uh, right? And then this becomes the basis for every, lambda calculus becomes the basis for every functional language in existence. The idea of propositions as types becomes the basis for every proof assistant in existence, beginning with de Bruyne's automath in the 1970s and Martin Luss type theory and so on, um, up through Agda, which I've written a textbook about recently, which was done by people looking at Martin Luss type theory uh, at Chalmers. They were inspired by that to do a programming language that's sort of a descendant of Agda. I think of Agda as what Haskell wants to be when it grows up. So all of these ideas that are very widely used come from this basic fundamental idea and this basic notion that we've got something here that you found independently twice. So that it is, oh, I can't do both hands at once with the background on. How odd. Um, there we go, two hands. You found it twice. So it is discovered rather than invented. I'm just gonna conclude with five, well, I'll pause there again. Are there any other questions about what I just did? Okay, so let me say a wee bit about philosophy. Normally I don't have much time for philosophy, but sometimes philosophy is important. As we saw, the key thing that Turing did that um, Church and Gödel had not done was philosophy. So one thing philosophers might think about is, well, how could we talk to aliens? So we've, we've actually attempted to do this. So this is a plaque that appears on the um, Discovery um, spaceship. So this is actually a model of Discovery in the backwards background to scale with two humans. And then this is a, a very schematic drawing of the solar system, sun, uh, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and from Earth you've got, there it is, Discovery, goes in an orbit around Mars and between Saturn and Jupiter. This is the Sun, and the length of these lines corresponds to the distance to various pulsars. Um, and then there are marks on these in binary. They're very small, so you can't see them, but the mark in binary is the frequency of hydrogen as viewed in these different pulsars to identify the different pulsars. Now, if aliens looked at this, what would they understand? Well, I think aliens would definitely understand that the length of a line corresponds to distance. They could probably work out binary. Would they understand this bit? Mm, well, I don't know. Um, if Star Trek is right, then they'd look at this and they'd go, wow, Human beings look just like us, except they don't have pubic hair. Um, but maybe Star Trek is not right, right? Maybe aliens look at this and go, mm, yummy, let's, ah, that's where they are. Let's go there and eat them all up. Maybe they look at this and they just go, wow, there are a bunch of weird line segments there. I wonder what that means. I can't work out what that means. Maybe their visual systems are very different than ours. And so this makes no sense to them at all. So it's a little bit hard. This, I think they could work out. This, maybe they could, maybe they couldn't. So that's talking to aliens in real, real life. Um, we also do this in the movies all the time. So it's a movie called Independence Day where the aliens come in and they destroy all these buildings like um, the Empire State Building and the White House. Um, th th this was back when destroying big buildings was a fantasy. It was before the World Trade Center. Uh, and this actually in the movie is the computer virus that they use to destroy uh, the aliens. And you can see it's written in C. Um, this movie came out um, before Java had spread throughout the known universe. So that's how I know it was done in C. I actually worked at Bell Labs at the time. So I thought, wow, something that one of my colleagues has done has made it into a movie. You can see it's a very funny dialect of C because it only has open curly braces, but not the closed curly braces. Would alien computers understand, be programmed in C? I suspect not. Would aliens be able to understand C if you sent it to them? 
Maybe, maybe not. I think it's like, you know, would they understand these pictures of people? They might be able to work out, see, they might not. Uh, if, if we sent them Perl or JavaScript, maybe even less chance of them working it out, but they might be able to work it out. They might be very clever. What about if we sent them Lambda calculus? Okay, I think implications is something that they'd understand. So if we sent them lambda calculus, I think that would be more like sending them line segments and working out, oh, the length of the line segment corresponds to distance between things. They would be able to work that out. So maybe what we should do is call lambda calculus the universal programming language, right? They might not program their computers in it, so we might not be able to send them a computer virus that they'll automatically upload written in lambda calculus, but they should be able to at least to decode and understand the lambda calculus. So should we call lambda calculus the universal programming language? Well, let's think about that for a moment. So um, in science and also in popular literature, it's become common to talk about multiverses, the idea that there's more than one universe. So this actually comes from a play called Constellations it's a love story between these two people and they just meet again and again and again in many different universes. And you see how their love story plays out in different universes. Um, and it, I, I, right, all of the um, proof rules we saw, right, have a line down the middle between the hypotheses and the conclusion. The name for that actually is a rule, a line like that is called a rule. And um, the play, the script of the play has these lines throughout it, and the description at the beginning of it says, a horizontal rule stands for a change of universe. So that's the script of the play. Um, so it takes place in many different universes. And scientists worry about, you know, are there many different universes? Because there's weird things like the, it turns out that if the strong electromagnetic, no, weak electromagnetic constant was just slightly different, then matter would never form. You, you could never have, um, atoms clumping together to form molecules and moles, molecules clumping together to form planets and so on. They say, wow, isn't it really weird that we live in a universe where this happens? And then they say, well, maybe not. Maybe there are lots and lots of different universes and we're in one where matter forms because we're here to see it. So they actually use thinking about multiple universes, even though we can't see them, to reason about things like why is the weak electromagnetic constant such that matter will form. So, um, I can imagine a universe with a different weak electromagnetic constant or a different law of gravitation. I might be limited in my imagination, but I cannot imagine a universe where the law of modus ponens does not hold. Even in a different universe, if I can show A implies B and I can show A, I can conclude B. I just can't imagine a universe where that is not true. So should we call Lambda calculus the universal programming language? Absolutely not. No, we cannot call it a universal programming language. Why can we not call it a universal programming language? Because calling it universal makes it too restricted. So that's the end of my talk. I will um, stop there. Uh, I'll just leave you with one last thought. Uh, if you're in a situation where you've got a tough job to do, then what you should think is that this is a job for Lambda Calculus. And uh, I'll stop there. Uh, if I was in person, I would take off my trousers as well, but I'm not going to do that. So maybe it's fortunate that we're not in person. <laughs> and uh, I'll stop there and uh, ask a question, please. Yes. Questions, please. No questions? Mm -hmm.
Uh, I have a question. Can you can you guys hear me well? Yes. So uh, thank you for your presentation, Walter. It was really cool to watch it. I have watched this presentation of yours, I think, uh, several times. <laughs> and uh, I think you, you have inspired a lot of people while doing this presentation. Uh, have you, do you have any idea how much people you have inspired by doing this presentation? No, you would probably have a better idea than I do. <laughs> But, well, well I, I think my YouTube viewing artists. numbers. So I know one video has been seen 50,000 times, um, but um, how many people who saw it were inspired by it, I could not tell you. So that's a, a question that uh, I would like to provoke you to think about it because I think it's a quite a lot of people. <laughs> well, that's a very nice thing to say. Thank you very much. So, 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 uh, so I, I have a question. Uh, so I think I think in the past these areas of study was was much closer to to human science, right? When you think about like Bertrand Russell or or Wittgenstein, right? They they were exploring the the same class of ideas, right? So so mathematical philosophy. At some point. Only, only the computer, the exact science guys remain in this space, right? So, 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 do you know if people from human sciences is still is still discuss philosophy in this context of computability? Is there anyone who would recommend that that is closer, like to the human science side of philosophy? So you're distinguishing human science from what logic? No, no, just just the schools in the universe, the groups of people, right? It's it's all the same thing, right? But 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 I think like people like Bertrand Husserl that use it to write books more about that talks about math, but also talk a lot about history, and um, and and these groups of science, they 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 seem that they. They have taken different paths since, since, since uh, in the more recent years, right? So, so, so you don't, you don't hear about modern philosophers that are talking about uh, lambda calculus, for example. Uh, well, okay. So there are two very different branches of philosophy, right? Mm -hmm. There's um, mathematical philosophy, logical philosophy. Uh, symbolic logic, which is what Bertrand Russell did at the beginning of his career with Principia Mathematica. And then you've got like ethical philosophy, what should people do, which is what Russell did at the end of his career. He actually deliberately switched because, um, right, after he came up with Russell's paradox, which was a variant on what I showed you with um, Gödel's proof and Right, Russell's paradox is being able to write down the statement, not this statement is not provable, but this statement is not true. And uh, trying to resolve that, he came up with, again, an earlier version of type theory. So Church called what he did types because Russell had his type theory, which was again, to get rid of inconsistencies in logic. Um, and Russell was actually had to work very hard on that and worked very hard on Principia Mathematica and was sort of burned out on mathematical logic when he was done. He basically said, I'm never doing that again. And he did, he switched to doing ethical logic. So um, ethics. So you're talking about the more humanitarian side of logic, uh, sorry, of philosophy. And Russell basically um, switched to that because he, he decided that mathematical logic was, was too tiring. All right. So, all right. Um, all right. I, I, if you're so the so so it, it's more one like thing that I know he, about, he was interested in both talks, right? And, and maybe he was he very saw interested them in both clothes, talks, right? right? Yeah. They're both worthy of interest. For myself, I'm more interested in mathematical logic and less right. interested in um, right. So I said at the beginning, I have little time for philosophy. I guess the philosophy I have little time for is not 
um, Russell's mathematical philosophy or Turing's where he comes up with Turing machines, but more the, um, I'm less interested for myself personally in studying the philosophy of ethics, although some of uh, Russell's ideas like founding the campaign for nuclear disarmament, that's something that I very much support. Um, so different people have different views, but um, the one thing I know about it is that Russell started doing the ethics because he found the mathematical logic too hard. All right. Or More at least questions. he got burned out on it. Maybe not too hard, but he decided, oh, this is this is very unpleasant and difficult. Let me try something simpler, like working out what right and wrong are. All right. Thanks. More questions? Good question. Well, I do have a, a question. Mm -hmm. that <clears throat> for computer people. Turing completeness is kind of the kind of essential. And for logic people, Turing completeness is kind of an anathema. So how do you fit this tension between these views of Turing completeness into the isomorphism? So why do you say Turing completeness is an anathema? You mean because, it, logic? because if you have a Turing twice... complete language for your logic, it leads to these paradoxes. Yes, exactly. For instance, the church exactly gave up, the, gave up, but I mean, they cre he created the, the typed lambda calculus exactly because the pure lambda, the untyped lambda calculus was not good for logic, for instance. So, right. Why for, for computer people, it's much more, it's Turing complete, I mean, and while the, the, Type of the lambda calculus is kind of a, more like a toy language. So, okay, so your question is there's a tension here and what do we do about this tension? Yes, exactly. Oh, how it fits into the isomorphism specifically, how the... Oh, how it fits. So yeah, the way it fits into the isomorphism is that if you... Um... So let me talk about a specific way in which it fits in, which, which I think is quite interesting. So I mentioned that in simply typed lambda calculus, um, all programs terminate. Hooray, all programs terminate. Isn't this wonderful? Oh, wait a minute. That means there will be recursive functions that I cannot write down, right? That, that's what follows. So on the one hand, you've got this really good property, which is that uh, everything terminates. But on the other hand, you have this, um, really annoying property, which is you cannot do all computable functions. So that's the tension, right? You have to pick between one or the other. And really what you want is both, right? You want to be able to pick and choose for what you're doing. So um, huge numbers of things you can write out um, just using structural recursions that always terminate. So ABDA only has structural recursions that always terminate. But you have some languages that have a fragment that always terminates and you use that for proofs. And then another fragment, which is bigger and you use that for computation. So one way of resolving the tension is to have a language with two fragments, a smaller one for proofs and a bigger one for programs. And one place where this shows up, where again, I think there's an unresolved issue is I mentioned uh, this logical view of session types. So in this logical view of session types, it's great. Everything terminates. There are no races. So everything's deterministic. Isn't this wonderful? But again, that means you cannot write all recursive functions. And also it means, oh dear, you know, right? On the one hand, no races is great. Everything's deterministic. These, these are all good properties of programs, just like terminating is. But on the other hand, it's bad. Um, maybe I want to sell tickets to a concert that's gonna sell out and who gets the tickets is determined by a race, right? Amazon, if they're selling a book, somebody gets, if they're selling books and they run out, somebody gets the last book. If you didn't have race conditions, you couldn't have Amazon working properly. 
you need to do something very different, like to make it deterministic, everybody gets a number and then you order and you know, whoever has the lowest number gets the book. But wait, assigning everybody a number, that'd be really difficult. No, we need races. So how do we go about adding races back into this logical view of session types? So um, for simply typed lambda calculus, we know this, you add the fixed point combinator, which gets you back general recursion. And the fixed point combinator actually has a type. For all A, give me an A to A function, I'll give you back an A. So you could use that to prove false, but you can also use it to define all recursive functions. Fixed point, and, and then you can tell, wait, do I maybe have a non-terminating recursion? Did I use the fixed point combinator or not? So you could have a fragment of your language with the fixed point combinator and a fragment without. What is the equivalent of that that gives us session types without races and with termination and session types possibly with races and possibly with non-termination? Is there one or two combinators that we could add in that would do that? I don't know. Um, I, I would love an answer to that question. I think probably there is a good answer, but we don't know the good answer yet. So the question you're asking is a really good question. And we sort of know an answer for terminating versus non-terminating, um, right? Full, full recursion versus just um, terminating, things that always terminate, like primitive recursions. But um, the question for things like concurrency is still an open question. I think a very important open question. Thank you. So for, yeah. is he saying that uh, typed lambda calculus is universal, but not the untyped one? Or omniversal, as you say? Um, so you're saying, would aliens necessarily know about untyped lambda calculus? I suspect, yeah. I don't have the same evidence that they would be sure to know about untyped lambda calculus but I'd be sort of surprised if somebody manages to discover typed lambda calculus without discovering untyped lambda calculus. I have just as much trouble envisioning a universe where nobody has figured out Turing machines as envisioning a universe where nobody has figured out modus ponens. But yeah, because I mean that they, the, the, they're unlikely to get exactly Turing machines, right? Turing machines themselves are something that you invent rather than discover. But the the general class of things, that's something that you discover, right? Turing machines themselves, as Turing would admit, are quite arbitrary. Okay, thanks. So, any more questions? There is a question on the chat. Roberto, if you oh, want to read it. Oh, okay. It's from Bonifacio. Yeah. Is that, okay, I can read the letter. Uh, I'd like to say that all this stuff represents a beautiful description of computer science history. Thanks for that. I also agree that the core of lambda calculus has been discovered instead of invented. In more specific aspects, I wonder whether the math came to explain a programming idiom, for instance, monads, or the math come as a design tool to find out a programming idiom for a particular problem. So. Okay, so this says for specific things like monads, would you say that those, would I say that those are invented or discovered? And um, the evidence is not as strong, but there's some evidence which I referred to. Uh, Done. That's okay. Where was it? Right, so monads correspond to a particular monad lo modal logic. So in that sense, I think one would say that monads were very much discovered. Um, and the idea is quite central actually in category theory. So that, you know, all of that is evidence that's sort of on the discovered side, um, but it's less strong than for this whole thing. So depending on which things you look at, right, there might be a continuum between being invented and discovered. 
I think his question in, in the end is more focused on the role of ma mathematics, whether it, the, you use mathematics as a design tool or as a, an, a, a, like a pre-tool to find things or a post-tool to explain things you already found. Oh, okay. So yeah, this is the question. Too. Thanks, Roberto. Do you use the mathematics to find the stuff or do you use it afterwards to explain the stuff? Well, of course you can do both. But um, my favorite technique is using the mathematics first to find the stuff, right? Certainly, arguably, that's what you, you know, how Eugenio Maggi found monads. He wasn't using the mathematics to uh, uh, explain something he already had. He used the mathematics to say, ah, right, this is the right structure for me to use. So the mathematics came first. And I think a lot of the Id good ideas come mathematics first. So the best way is mathematics first. The next best way is mathematics second. The worst way is if mathematics never comes into it at all. Thanks. Thanks. Well, so I think we are at the time to, to end the section. Again, I'd like to thank Philip very much for his talk. And that's it. Thanks to everybody for participating everybody in the audience and so let's finish the session thanks well thank you everybody for coming thank you again to the organizers um, and thank you for the questions and for the kind words and um, I, I look forward to finally actually going to Natal. <laughs> thank you and thanks Philip for accepting our invitation to come to SDLP at least victory <laughs> <laughs>